Hello, and I'd like to welcome you um, to the Billerica, Massachusetts Demo Lab for Brooker. This morning, um, at least it's morning here in our time zone, um, we're going to give you a presentation on the MALDI IHC workflow, something that's new that's coming to our imaging um, capabilities. So my name is Dr. Kate Stumpo, and I'm the business development manager for the imaging business in the Americas. Um, as I said, this slide from the lab is going to focus on the MALDI IHC workflow. I'm going to go through the utility of this and the practical aspects, and then we'll turn things over um, a few minutes into this to Dr. Josh Fisher, who's one of our application scientists here, and he's going to take you through basic operations of the TIMS TOF, and he's going to show you data readout in Skills Lab. So we'll see you again in a few minutes, Josh. Thank you. And so let me get zoomed in here. Um, we have a poster where we've printed out some of the, the key things that we'd like to impart to you today. So mass spectrometry is a widely accepted key technique in um, evaluating differences of cellular expression. And it's a key tool in disease-based research. MALDI imaging of metabolites, small molecules, and lipids has been applied to the tumor microenvironment to PKPD relationships in drug target evaluation and to general metabolic cycles of interest. However, if we think about and look at the overall genomics cascade and how that leads to information that's encoded with proteins and then the small molecule readout that we're able to do, we've been missing a piece of that with the protein portion. It's been difficult to visualize the spatial location of proteins in a broad field of view and with a highly multiplex system until now. And so that's the workflow that we want to tell you about today um, and expose you to. As you look at this cascade again, um, I just wanna point out once more that it's, it's highly important to be able to tie the protein information and contextualization back to your genomic information and then also have the downstream small molecules that are able to additionally inform and give you a complete picture. We think that this is um, a true approach to multi-omics methods because you're getting information from multiple sources and it gives you a systems biology approach that brings in proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, and even glycomics, if that's of interest to you. And it kind of culminates with this MALDI IHC workflow to tie everything back together. So I'd like to take you through this workflow and tell you the basic operations of what's needed and what different components are gonna be needed to do this. So as with all of our imaging workflows, you're going to mount your tissue on a Brooker and Telly slide and do your further imaging experiments and visualization that way. The one additional step that gets put into here is the immunohistochemistry workflow and staining. So before you can go on to your MALDI experiment, you need to do a typical IHC protocol. Luckily, if you have questions on IHC at the end of this, we do have Mark Lim from Ambergen present with us today in the lab, and he'll be able to answer any questions that you might have on those protocols. Typically, this is done overnight, although some labs may choose to do this in a, in a more high throughput fashion. And so the time component that this adds to your MALDI workflow is typically between two and 12 hours. The only other additional piece of equipment that's necessary is a UV light box so that you can photo cleave these tags. And when I get down to the bottom panel here, I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the chemistry that's going on and how these are released and how we then subsequently detect them. After photo cleavage, again, this is a really short process, about five minutes. Um, these are light boxes that are available on um, consumer websites and, and don't have a, a high price point. Then we move on to the typical matrix application that's part of a MALDI imaging workflow, done typically with our HTX sprayers that we um, also offer as part of our imaging bundles. And then you can do this on the Brooker Tim's Top Flex or on a Rappi Flex. So this is a multi-platform enabled workflow, um, depending on what capabilities you have or are interested in for your overall mass spectrometry needs. And then lastly, readout in Skills Lab. 
and this is what Josh is really going to focus on uh, when I turn this over to him in a few minutes. And he's going to take you through the basic operations of the Flex, how easy it is to do calibration, and then he'll take you into looking at some of the readout. So as we look at these photocleavable tags a little bit more in depth and think about the process and try to visualize a little bit more specifically what's going on here. So the photocleavable tags are an antibody of interest that have this red photocleavable portion. And then it's a little bit faint in my poster here, but there's a mass tag on here. And those are typically peptides. These are unique reporter peptides. Um, Ambergen offers or will soon be offering up to 100 different versions of these reporter peptides for the conjugation with antibodies. You would then do that photo cleavage step in the UV light box. And what's happening is that photo cleavable portion is actually breaking. There is no spatial dislocation happening here. So everything is staying in the same place. But then you now have a measurable mass tag that you're able to ionize in the mass spectrometer, and that will be unique for the different antibodies of interest that you're looking at. To show you what this looks like down on the slide, so we have a, a Bricker and Tully slide here um, with a couple of tissue sections that have been placed down. And I've got four different colors of antibodies represented here, just showing you that there are, are four different tags in this particular mass spectrum. And then MALDI imaging would be done on these tissue sections, and we would go to the readout. There's a sample mass spectrum here from a 19-plex experiment. So the little red arrows are pointing to the different, the 19 different mass tags of interest. And notice the overall background on the spectrum. Because these are peptide reporter molecules, these ionize very efficiently and very cleanly. There's not a lot of chemical noise background that's present, which is part of the beauty of enabling um, a wide number of things to be imaged at once. So this is one of the, the really big important factors of this workflow um, is the capability to multiplex at a very high level, and it does not increase your time in your analysis. So then after this is done, we have targeted images that result. So I've got four different colors here kind of corresponding to my four initial tags of interest. And you can see the different spatial expression for these. In addition to doing this spatial expression, these tags can also have a fluorophore on them. And so you could also do a fluorescence experiment and have an additional layer of information. Something I didn't really touch on too much here is that you also are able to do small molecule imaging with this. So um, we have demonstration of looking at metabolites and lipids as it overlays with the MALDI IHC workflow. Um, and if you'd like more information on any of that or what's capable, then we encourage you to contact us um, and we're happy to get you more information. So that was kind of a quick overview of the workflow in general. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Josh Fisher so that he can show you the practical operation of the system. Um, and you'll have to excuse me for a moment as I hand off the, the headset. And then Josh will be here to, to continue this discussion with you. All right, thanks, Kate. Okay, so hi everyone. So before we get into the actual instrumentation and using the instrument for the IHC workflow, I actually want to take a second to just introduce the instrument and some of the components and that might help uh, understanding what's going on as we go through the workflow. So here in front of me is the Maldi Timstoff Flex instrument that we're going to be using for the demo today. Um, so as the name implies, this is equipped with Trapped Ion Mobility Spectrometry Technology or TIMS. Um, but the Ambergen workflow that we're going to use doesn't need that, so we're going to turn the TIMS off for this experiment for the sake of speed because uh, that'll make it run faster. So the instrument is equipped with obviously a MALDI source. So the MALDI source loads right here. It's got a nice atmospheric pressure interface. There's just this little lever that I'm pulling up and down here, and you can put your target that you're going to be shooting in and out of this chamber. On the other side of the instrument, it's a little bit hard to see because of the camera angle, we have a nano ESI source, or not a nano, I'm sorry, we have a 
regular ESI source. And this is part of the dual source technology that this instrument is equipped with. So what's really neat is these sources both interface in the same region at the same pressure. So it makes switching back and forth between MALDI and ESI very, very fast, very easy. And um, I'll demonstrate that a little bit later into the, the program. The last thing I want to show you is below this MALDI 2 technology logo, we actually have a syringe here and the syringe is loaded with calibrant. So that way we can do our mass calibrations and if you're using TIMS, which we aren't today, you can do your TIMS calibrations by switching really quick uh, to the ESI source, you can calibrate, then you can switch right back to MALDI and we'll, we'll do that actual workflow in real time in a second here. Okay, so I think that's all that I wanted to show for the instrument. So now we'll switch over to the instrument control interface. Just share my screen really quick. Okay. So on the this is the instrument control interface that we have here. And what I'm gonna do now is the target is loaded into the instrument. We're gonna just click the load button to show how long it takes to go through the actual loading process. So we just click this button here the instrument switches to a docking mode and it's it's pulling the uh, target into the chamber now. While it's going, we can talk about the layout of the interface a little bit. We have some general commands that you can access for different menus up top in this blue bar, you know, instrument power and uh, methods and all that kind of stuff. Directly below that in this leftmost panel, we have kind of a readout interface, right? So we have all these colored lights to tell you whether or not the instrument is functioning and ready to go for the experiment or what it's doing. Beneath that, we have some toggle switches, right? MALDI, post-ionization, and TIMS. So this is how you switch back and forth between the different operating modes of the instrument and everything's as quick and easy as just toggling these switches back and forth. And then beneath that is a couple instrument controls. So to the right of that, we have the MALDI interface here, right? And we can see the camera and the camera is changing things and moving in real time um, as it loads. So one of the neat features of the instrument is that the IntelliSlides and the uh, MALDI targets we use have barcodes and other marks on them. So right now we can see the camera is actually scanning over a barcode. So the IntelliSlides barcode will actually be automatically registered to a database on the instrument PC and this will help you know, facilitate high throughput measurements and keeping everything nice and in order you won't be able to overwrite data and, and things like that. So it's a really nice, useful feature. Um, the other thing that the uh, instrument will do for you is it'll do an automatic height detection, which you'll see here in a second, where it's going to measure the height of the slide at various places. Because the imaging process uses such fine resolution, you know, in the 10 to 50 micron range, you can do 100 even if you wanted. Um, Small variations in the height of the slide will actually affect the laser focus. So you have to create a target profile, and then as the instrument moves, those variations will be accounted for, and it'll correct them automatically. And this will help mitigate some of those problems you can get from variations in the height profile. And we can see that's what it's doing right now. It's shining a laser. The laser is being used to verify the height of the instrument down to the micron level, and it will adjust for it as it needs to. Um, so another feature that we have here beneath the target is uh, a cartoon of the target itself. And on the cartoon, we have these different virtual wells. So you can see there's like a blue circle here. This tells you where the MALDI laser is currently going to hit the target. And if you click on a different space, it will move the target to that point. So that point is being targeted by the laser instead. So these virtual walls are really useful because it lets you quickly move around your target and uh, you know, get to where you need to be in order to do your experiment, right? We have the slide adapter two in right now. So you can see there's this outline of shapes. This is the top slide and the bottom slide. So this is, a, you know, a really nice useful tool. So all this is finishes up, we'll cover the last panels of the instrument display. We have uh, the mass spectrum readout view, which is blank right now, because we're not actually taking any data, um, but this, you know, when you actually take beta is where your mass spectrum is gonna present. So you can see in real time what the instrument is reading out and what it's doing. And then beneath that, we have the different instrument control parameters that you can adjust. These parameters are all grouped into categories by these tabs to facilitate quick and user-friendly interface, right? If we had all of this in one menu, it would just be really, really overwhelming. Um, all right, so that covers the basic instrument interface. The instrument is finished loading the target plate. You can tell because it now says in in the state instead of that bright orange notification that it's working. So 
in addition to using the virtual wells to move around like I'm doing right now, you can also move around by just clicking on the Maldi camera screen. So if you wanna go up, you click above the center of the screen and it will move up to where you've clicked. So this is a really nice intuitive interface in order to move around and find what you want. So say you know there's a tissue in this area and you have to move around for it, you can move until you see the boundary of the tissue, right, which is what we're seeing right here, and find where you need to be. All right, so now that the instrument interface is all set up, I'd like to take a quick second to show you how fast we can switch back and forth between ESI and actually do a mass calibration in ESI mode that we will use for the MALDI experiment. So like I said, everything is as quick as easy as just toggling these switches. So when I click the MALDI off, right, the instrument inherently runs in ESI mode and we can see the MALDI controls have all disappeared and now we're getting the instrument in ESI node. So since ESI is continuous, right, you can see the detector's always looking for something. So we can see a little bit of the, the detector noise coming up here. So in order to turn on that calibrant syringe that I talked about earlier, we just click this activate button, the light turns green, and that tells us that the syringe pump is indeed pumping and we are now spraying ESI ions. So this is tune mix that we have in the, the Agilent tune mix that we have in the syringe right now. So calibration, is also very fast and very easy. We just go to the calibration tab, we choose the tune mix that we want from our reference list, and then we just click the calibrate button. Once we click that, it automatically finds the peaks for us and then assigns them and calibrates. So we'll get a little score here, and if this is within our spec threshold, it'll light up green, which means everything's great, and we just click accept, and the instrument is calibrated, and that's it. Um, if we wanna go back to MALDI mode, we just click MALDI and we're back already. There's no complicated procedures, no changing of vacuum, no, none of that stuff. It's very nice, all right? So now that we are in MALDI mode and we have our method ready, we uh, only have to do a little bit of fine tuning here, right? The methods for the instrument are very mass range specific. Uh, so there's not really a lot to change looking at the different classes of molecules so much. It's more just the mass range that you want. So we load the method that we want to look at. In this case, it's this IHC peptides method. And let's just get there really quick. Okay, that method's loaded. Uh, we can see we lost the calibration, right? So when you do change methods, you might change some of the parameters and this light turns red to tell us that. So this is also really nice. So we can just switch back really quick. We can turn back on the syringe pump. The ions are already back. We calibrate, accept, and go back to MALDI mode. The light's green, so we now know the instrument's calibrated and it's good to use for the experiment. So in terms of the fine tuning I was talking about, the only thing that you really have to fine tune is the laser power. That's gonna vary because the matrix application from experiment to experiment is gonna vary, the tissue height is gonna vary, the tissue itself is gonna vary. So you have to play with the laser power a little bit. You can turn it up or down just simply by using this slider and that will change the laser power in real time. And you can get a feel for what kind of ions you want. So if we zoom in here, we can actually look and in order to kind of uh, demonstrate how the, the Amergen multiplexing system works. These are all different indicator peptides and they're all separated by four Daltons, which is basically the isotopic, isotopic range that these tags have. So we have five different tags showing up in this very narrow ras mass range from 1210 to about 1245. And uh, you know, it can be pushed even further than that. So this is looking, uh, looking pretty good. So we can actually start we just have to save the method. This will save the mass calibration as well as the new laser power. So we just go to this method dropdown, click the save button and it's it's saved. So now that we've got our method all perfected, we can just actually start using the flex imaging workflow that we'll use for the actual image acquisition. So flex imaging is a software that we provide with the imaging toolkit. Um, so you just open the software, set up a new imaging around and we just walk through the wizard and the wizard will take us through everything and it's really nice. It takes advantage of a lot of the features of the Intel slides, which we'll go through as it's, it's scanning and using them. So we're gonna use skills autopilot. We click okay. The slide that we wanna use is in the top. It'll prompt you to enter some information um, about the actual 
data file that you want to save so we can just enter that really quick you can choose your directory there's a browse feature that works just like every other windows pop-up does and then you can uh, enter any notes that you'd want here all right we click next we choose the size that we want to do the acquisition at so 20 microns and then the acquisition method that we'd like to use so this is the immunohistochemistry peptides method we click next and the wizard is off and it's doing its thing so we'll switch back to the flex imaging interface so we can see on the intellicides there's actually uh, fiduciaries teaching marks and that's what you're seeing in the camera right now so the software will actually go through and it will take images of these teaching marks and overlay them with the image that you've provided of your slide and that will tell the instrument hey when i'm in this mechanical position on the instrument it's shooting this part of the image and then the software can then use that further uh, to basically make it so you can just select a region and image it and have a good overlay and a good size match up and all those kinds of fine details of the imaging workflow so the other thing is is um, flex imaging also will use the image of the barcode and the height profile that were made earlier when we loaded the target and use those to make sure you're not overwriting existing data and you're taking unique data and all those kinds of things. It will work with the database that we were talking about earlier. All right. So once it's gone through and it's done the uh, the teaching, it'll tell you, hey, we're, we're good. We just keep walking through the wizard. We click next. Um, so performance check, this will do target profile. You can do the focus adjustment, which we already did when we loaded it, and the MS calibration, which we also already did, but you could have a spot where you have matrix um, get ablated and you can use that. So we can just click start. It's gonna use the target profile from the beginning, finish, and voila, the wizard's done. And right, if we wanted to, for example, go look at this fiduciary here, we can click this target mover joystick here, and Wherever we click on the target, it's going to move to in the instrument. So we can see we're looking at that fiduciary now. If we want to go back and we want to look at, uh, say, the tissue here, we just click on the um, interface. And now we're looking at the tissue where we clicked. So that's really nice, really convenient way to move around really quickly. One of the other really cool tools about the autopilot that we actually disabled to fill uh, illustrate some other things is it will automatically select the tissue for you now we kind of wanted to show live how that works but we have this magic wand tool and if you go and you just highlight a piece of tissue inside the grid with the magic wand skills will automatic or not skills flex imaging will automatically outline and target that image for you which this is really nice because the alternative is you just manually go around and draw many pixels that many clicks at a time an outline around the tissue so this is a great time saver and it's really convenient and the same magic wand tool is what skills autopilot will use to automatically highlight the tissue sections on your slide all right so now that we've chosen our method we've chosen our raster size and we've selected a region of tissue if we want to start the actual imaging run we just click start the start auto execute run button it will ask you a couple other questions right you want to measure everywhere etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, you just click ok when you're done and flex imaging will take control of the Timstoff and start imaging and we can see in real time we're getting the image it's moving along you know a really nice clip i was really happy and excited when i saw that the first time and then we're also getting uh the peptide tags that we're looking for so we're not going to sit here and wait for two hours and some change right it tells you how long is remaining in the image uh, that would be a lot of time to fill so we're going to just fast forward to some already acquired data that we've done with this workflow so this data was acquired on a rapaflex so this uh, ihc workflow it works on multiple platforms basically um and what's really convenient is because these peaks are these mass tags are already known their mass we know they're going to be there you can make an existing mass list and you can import it into flex imaging so we can just go import import from the list and then you select the uh, list so that's this 19 plex here and because the masses are known the skills software will just automatically go and check to see if there's any ion intensity there so you can just generate the images 
any annotations you have in this list that you have brought in, if you do them within the, the format that the list reads in, will also be preserved. So we can see we get our 19 flex automatically. We've generated all the images, we've annotated all the images, and we can start looking at the different features in real time. So we can see, you know, we just click on the different images and you get, or the different masses and you get the different images. And we can see what's really nice about this IHC workflow is the specificity with which you can target different regions. So if we look, you know, for example, at this uh, cytokeratin antibody, right, we see this like kind of marbled texture with these thin empty spaces. But if we come down here and we look at this anti uh Podolphin and Pina, they're a little more ubiquitous, they're a little more everywhere. If we look at this Vimentin, it's also a similar marbling pattern, but there's a lot more detail up here, right? So the IHC workflow, you know, each one of these proteins that we're binding the antibody to is in these specific locations. All right, so I think that covers the basic workflow. So at this point, I'm going to turn things back over to Kate and uh, Mark, and they're going to handle any questions that you guys have. All right, so hello again from Kate. Um, I'm off camera, and Josh is going to put up on the screen um, how you input a question in case you are, you're not sure how to do that. Um, I also wanted to comment that the poster board that I was showing earlier will be incorporated into a brochure. Um, and so if you weren't able to see everything completely and you want to, to kind of have a more of a summary, um, we'll have a, a brochure coming out fairly soon. It looks like many of the questions here are, are quite technical. Um, so I'm going to go back and forth between Josh and Mark in order to, to get answers for everyone. So I'm going to start with, um, is this done on FFPE tissue? And is that explaining, explaining the low signal background? Um, and I'm going to hand my headset to, to Mark to answer that. OK, thank you for your great question. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we can use both uh, FFP and Fresh Frozen. Um, in, in the case uh, that Josh showed you, it was an FFPE. Um, if we start with the frozen, Fresh Frozen, uh, we essentially convert it to a formalin fixed tissue before doing the IHC steps. Uh, the low background primarily stems from the fact that it is a, a formalin fixed tissue at the point where we do the mass tag, the antibody staining. So uh, between all the blocking and the washing and the antigen retrieval steps that are normal for IHC, uh, by the time you get to the endpoint, you know, anything that's not fixed uh, has been washed away. So you're not seeing the endogenous uh, tissue molecules at that point. So that's one particular reason the background is so clean. Also because the peptide mass tags ionize very, very well. Thank you so much, Mark. The next question I'm gonna to pitch to Josh. Um, the question is, can you do this with TIMS on? And could you also talk about some of the other instrument features such as resolution? Yeah, so you could absolutely do this with TIMS on. Um, the only thing is, is with TIMS on, it slows down the acquisition a little bit, um, and that's just the nature of TIMS. And the reason we chose not to is because we, you know, with all the the washing and whatnot, as you saw, there's not really a lot of other stuff on the tissue, so we don't really need the TIMS to separate everything. Everything we're seeing, we put there, and it's already mass resolved. Um, that being said, you know, if you wanted to use TIMS and you had some clever experiments to to use TIMS with, not a problem. Um, you'd actually just have to, there's an extra calibration step, but you just have to click this TIMS on and it would turn the TIMS on. Um, so other features about the instrument, you mentioned resolution specifically. So uh, the resolution, it, it's a mass dependent thing. So as you get to higher masses, you start losing resolution. That's a, a natural phenomenon of time of flight instruments. Um, so, but around a thousand, we usually see around 40,000 to 60,000 to be on the safe side. Uh, you know, a, a good, well-tuned instrument uh, can do much, uh, much better. Uh, for spatial resolution, the Tim's Tough Flex can go all the way down to about 10 microns pretty comfortably. Um, that being said, 10 micron measurements take a very long time. So, uh, you know, just something to be aware of and they're, they're a little bit technical sometimes too. There's some considerations to make sure that resolution is good, right? You're pushing the instrument to its limits, so you have to really make sure that you've taken care of crossing your T's and dotting your I's. Uh, more traditional 
spatial resolutions are on the 20 to 50 microns. So this is 20 microns and we can see it's going quite fast and we're gonna do an entire tissue in about two hours. If you were to do that at 50 microns, you're dividing by that time by about five or six actually. Um, so even less, it's very, very quick. And if you need really coarse measurements, uh, you can do it even you know, 100 microns and then the measurement would be done in like a half an hour. Um, I think that's everything that was presented to me in that question. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, appreciate the, the highly technical delving into some of these details. So for the next question, I'm gonna throw it back to Mark again. Um, there's one on how does this compare to technologies such as Codex, um, also now renamed as the PhenoCycler, in case you're, you're up on the current lingo. So I'm gonna hand this back to Mark. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think it's more you know, of a pro and con situation. Um, you know, it's MALDI imaging, as we know, isn't going to yet get uh, optical scale spatial resolution as a fluorescence, immunofluorescence based approach. Although with the latest Brooker instruments, we are we are now getting down to five micron. Uh, uh, the uh, the other pros uh, for our approach are we can get to very high multiplexing uh, with the mass tags without the need for any iterative cycling uh, for the decoding steps in, in, in methods like the codex and whatnot, or the T-SISIF. Um, um, and, and a third item is the, the multi-omic approach. You, the, the fact that uh, you can start with a fresh frozen and leverage the MALDI imaging capabilities to first measure uh, the untargeted endogenous small molecules, drugs, metabolites, lipids, et cetera, uh, which is something that no uh, probe-based approach can really do. And then on the same tissue section, you can go in and, and with our mass tag antibody probes and do some targeted macromolecules such as protein. So I think that multi-omic aspect uh, is really, really uh, important for our method. Thanks again, Mark. Okay, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, again, for Mark, I think. So it's a good thing we have him here with us today in Bilrica. So uh, a question is, could I get my favorite antibody tagged by Ambergen with the photocleavable tag and a fluorescence tag? Yeah, so absolutely. Right now we're sort of in a beta launch phase uh, of our product, um, but we are uh, taking custom orders. And we do have what we call these uh, dual label probes where we put on to in anybody, both the photocleavable mass tag um, as well as a fluorophore for, for this uh, dual, moda dual modality imaging. So, uh, so yes, we can custom label your antibody. It needs to meet certain requirements for labeling, which are pretty standard for most methods of labeling, such as uh, protein carrier-free, no BSA, uh, in our case, because of the chemistry, no amine-containing buffers, so no tris, no glycine, but your basic uh, requirements for labeling antibodies, if, if, if uh, and anybody meets those requirements, we can we can certainly tag it for you on a custom basis. Also, the dual labeled probes. Okay, I think we're going to have one more handoff back and forth here with Mark. So the next question is: um, Is the tag applied at the peptide or protein? Can you talk a little bit more about that measurable mass tag and just summarize that once more? So the photocleavable mass tag is a, pe uh, a peptide, uh, which is directly and covalently conjugated to the probe, such as an antibody. Uh, and so you basically end up with an antibody uh, with a photocleavable linker uh, at, uh, attached to the peptide mass tag. We get multiple mass tag copies per probe. Uh, that is, uh, once the tissue is stained with the probe and, and dried, uh, the photocleavage takes place offline before uh, the MALDI mass spectrometry imaging. So it goes and we zap it in the light box to cleave all the tags, uh, which liberates from the antibody, uh, uh, basically the peptide reporter, which we can fine tune with stable isotopic amino acids and different sequences to change our mass. And uh, there's a small portion of the photocleavable linker that stays attached uh, to the peptide reporter, and that's what we measure in the, in the mass spectrometer. Okay, hopefully that was a, a comprehensive answer um, from, from the question that was submitted there. And if not, then please feel free to, to put a question back into the question portion. Um, the next one I think I can actually answer, so I'm going to take a stab at this. I'm feeling a little left out um, with these guys handling most of this. 
So how closely are the fiduciary marks placed? What is the depth of tissue used in a typical imaging experiment? And can one perform multi-layer imaging if needed? So there are a number of questions here. So the, the teaching marks, the fiduciary marks, are laser etched into the Intelli slides. And so they are at specific positions so that the optical image is co-registered correctly with the slide. Um, so that's all prefabricated for you. Um, and it looks like Josh is highlighting those on the screen at the moment. So you can see what these look like. The next question was, what's the depth of tissue typically used? We typically recommend that you section tissue at 10 to 12 microns. Um, there are some users who will go to lower thicknesses, such as five or six microns, so that they can also do histological staining and other things after the imaging experiment. However, getting that tissue mounted does require a few extra tips and tricks that we're, we're happy to impart and get you started on um, optimizing that method within your own lab. And then the last question there was, can one perform multi-layer imaging if needed? Yes, you can. And this is another thing that when we, we go through training with new users, um, we, we educate how to go about doing this to, to build an effective analytical experiment that can go over the same piece of tissue um, up to five times. Typically, we recommend that you do a larger spatial resolution in an experiment like that in order to leave behind some tissue so that you're able to um, you know, ablate more material within the pixel as you go through. Um, so I hope that answered the question. And then it looks like the, the last theme that I'm seeing within the question tab is on quantitation. Um, and so I'm gonna pitch this back to Mark um, so that he can give you a little bit more insight there. Yes, so we haven't yet done a, a quantitative comparison between uh, our uh, MALDI IHC method and say, you know, standard immunofluorescence. We've done a lot of qualitative comparisons, uh, in some cases using our dual labeled probe, in some cases using separate fluorescent probes between the MALDI IHC um, and, and the immunofluorescence. And, you know, in terms of sensitivity, uh, we've tested over uh, 40 antibodies so far, spanning a wide range of biomarker classes, uh, membrane proteins, FOXP3, which is low abundance. And, um, you know, in all cases, we've been able to, anything that uh, immunofluorescence has been able to detect, we've been able to detect uh, with the MALDI IHC. And in a few cases where we had problems, we traced it to essentially a, a bad antibody um, and, and found a better clone. So, uh, again, we've done a lot of comparisons between the MALDI IHC and immunofluorescence. Um, we also run an isotype control blank um, as a negative control. Um, we're working on the quantification, um, you know, it's going to involve putting uh, standards, internal standards uh, in the matrix, possibly antibody standards, because antibodies will have different affinities, so uh, you might need uh, some, some external antibody standards on the slide as well. Okay, so that's the, the end of um, kind of the, the unique questions that I'm seeing come up in the like to end today by saying um, I hope you enjoyed this and found it educational on some of our new workflows, specifically this MALDI IHC workflow where we're partnering with Ambergen in order to bring new technologies to you in order to continue to innovate at the multi-omic level and bring you true multi-omic solutions. If you have further questions, um, my email was in your GoToWebinar invite. You're welcome to reach out to me and I'll get things directed as needed to the appropriate person. Um, I'll be happy to funnel all of that. This was recorded and so you should get a copy of the recording after the webinar is over. And if you know anyone who wanted this and was not able to attend today, um, we're happy to, to continue to meet with them. So thank you so much for your attention um, wherever you are in the world today. I hope you have a lovely day and I look forward to, to hearing from many of you. Cheers. And bye from Josh, who's waving in the camera. Bye. <laughs>